Let's talk some Cardinals baseball. What's going on, everyone? And welcome in to this edition of B-Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer joining you here on Saturday night, April 14th, 2024. On the night, the Cardinals lose to the Arizona Diamondbacks out in the desert by a final score of 4-2. to two. And I had quite the perspective on tonight's game, if I'm being honest. I didn't watch a moment of it. I was at the fabulous Fox Theater in St. Louis with my wife. We saw the musical The Book of Mormon. If you've never seen it or heard of it, make sure you Google it before you decide to go because it may not be for you. But uh, what a really smart and funny show. But nevertheless, I watched the condensed version of the Cardinals game after the fact. And so this episode is going to be a little bit different because I want to give you my impressions of the things that stuck out to me watching it after the fact. I didn't live with it for three hours or two and a half hours like all the Cardinal fans who watched it live may have done. But I want to talk about some of the key moments in the game and whether I thought they've been portrayed maybe fairly unfairly by some in the media. Cardinals had some base running mistakes tonight, some of which I think were a little costly. Others I thought Arizona D-backs broadcast decided to kind of harp on, and it legitimately could not have mattered less. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about Kyle Gibson and the mishap with Wilson Contreras figuring out the pitch com, figuring out the pitch selection, and ultimately it's the one that goes awry as Guriel Jr. hits the three-run home run that ultimately sinks the Cardinals. And what else sank the Cardinals tonight was their performance with runners in scoring position, but not just that, but the base running that tied to it because they did get a couple of hits with Risp, but they didn't drive in enough runs with Risp. So we'll talk about all of those factors tonight for the Cardinals as they lose 4-2, to two, they drop to 7-8 and eight on the season. They just can't seem to get away from the magnet that ping-pongs them between a 500 record and a one game below 500 record. But all that's coming up on B-Shape Daily tonight. Make sure to hit that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen so that you can catch all of our Cardinals content all season long. You can also follow and subscribe to B-Shape Daily on Spotify. It's my daily Cardinals podcast. I'm Brendan Schaefer covering the Cardinals as a writer for KMOV, so I cover a lot of the home games. I'm in the Cardinals clubhouse. I'm there for post game. all those things. On the road, I'm typically with you guys, talking it over on YouTube and on the podcast on Spotify. But if that's a perspective that you think could add to your enjoyment of Cardinals baseball this summer, then I invite you to join me and hit that subscribe. We do some live streams, too. I've been really kind of greasing the wheels a little bit with uh, folks in the live chat during some of the live streams talking about maybe doing some MLB The Show content where we'll talk some baseball while we play the show. That could be something that if I can get the PS5 stuff squared away, we'll do that later on during this season. But glad you're with me tonight. Let's go ahead and do first things first. Talking about the Kyle Gibson outing tonight. He looked pretty solid in the early innings of this one as Gibby was able to limit the damage in the first inning to just one run after loading up the bases. Could have been a much worse situation, especially when you think back to the first inning that he had back on Sunday in St. Louis when the Cardinals got walloped by the Marlins in that game. So limiting the damage there and then basically settling in. Frames two, three, four, and 5, all scoreless for Kyle Gibson. But the moment of the game for him, unfortunately, on the downside comes. They're in the sixth inning, and it's Lourdes Gurriel Jr. up to the plate. And Kyle Gibson ultimately having some issues with the pitch com as it was described post-game by Ollie Marmel. I heard that played over the radio on the drive home from the Fox Theater tonight. But then I went and checked out what Kyle Gibson's comments were after the game about that exact same moment, and I think it'll be interesting to Cardinals fans. So I'll play this courtesy of Bally Sports Midwest. Cardinals pitcher Kyle Gibson talking about that ill-fated moment in the sixth, and you hear the question, too, from John Denton of MLB.com, where the pitch com was kind of acting up, but it was also a result of Gibby shaking off Wilson Contreras in a moment that I think looking back now, he wishes he hadn't. So was, there a, was there a pitch com um, malfunction there? Uh, you had to step off, and then you punched it in yourself. And Yeah, there was a couple of times it was weird. You know, I haven't really had that all year. There was a couple of times where it just didn't, you know, didn't come through. But, um, you know, when Willie and I are on the same page and I'm really not shaking, you know, it's easy to kind of figure out where the pitch is and on the on the transmitter. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the couple of times that I had issues, I was trying to find, you know, whatever mm-hmm. pitch I wanted and I was just, I kept hitting the wrong button. So I had to step off because I just wasn't, you know, finding the right pitch there. And, you know, Willie called slider and I wanted to throw a sinker and, you know, sometimes you got to uh, just say yes to your catcher mm-hmm. and move on. He did a good job. He was right on there and you know, I messed up and shook to the wrong pitch. 
Cardinals pitcher Kyle Gibson talking about the moment in the sixth inning where Lord Escariel Jr. takes him deep. It's on a sinker inside, 92, off the plate. Really would be in on the hands, but it just... It, there was nothing fooling Guriel on this on this moment. I'll play for you the response to from Kyle Gibson on what he thought of the individual pitch. And objectively, where he put it, there wasn't really anything wrong with that. It wasn't a strike. It was it was inside by a couple of of baseball widths from being even on the inside corner. But it just seemed like Guriel, for whatever reason, was all over it. Cardinal pitcher Kyle Gibson on that pitch in particular and the location and what he thought of the way that it played out. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'd say obviously I like one pitch back, but, um, man, I look back at it, I really can't set it any, in a better place, you know, trying to get a double play there, keep a ball on the ground and, you know, executed a ball down and into a guy that I've thrown that pitch to him a decent amount of times in my career and it hasn't ended up like that. So um, he put a really good swing on it. You know, only he can tell you his approach right there, but... Unfortunately, sometimes you got to tip your cap and, and say that he got you. But, um, you know, felt really good, had good stuff. But um, it's unfortunate to, to give up the long weather in that spot. That audio, once again, courtesy of Bally Sports Midwest, Cardinals starter Kyle Gibson talking about the pitch he threw to Guriel, which you heard him say to the reporters there just a moment ago when we played the previous clip that he called for a sinker, whereas Wilson Contreras had called for slider. He said, when we're on the same page, I'm not really having those pitch comm issues, but I was trying to find a particular pitch, wasn't able to to find it quickly enough, so he stepped off, I think was under duress a little bit with the pitch clock in that moment, and you could say, well, that's what cost him. Not really, though. Like the look, like I said, the location was good. He wondered later on, was it a little bit flat? Continued to be asked about the pitch. Was it, was it flatter than a normal sinker from him? He was hoping to be able to get Guriel to beat it into the ground. You heard him say, I've thrown that that pitch to him before. It didn't end up like that. He had mentioned at one point in the postgame uh, interview that he'd have to go back and look, and, and he can't imagine there have been very many of those types of pitches and those types of counts hit for extra bases against him. Off the top of his head, he really didn't recall anything like that. So it's just one of those moments. And he said a couple of times. You heard it there, and he also mentioned it later on. I won't play all the clips for you, but uh, you can check out at uh, Bally Sports Midwest on Twitter for that the, the rest of that video and that post game interview, but he mentioned too going you just had, you'd have to ask Guriel what he was thinking and looking for. It seemed honestly like Kyle Gibson was just a little bit bewildered at what Guriel was able to do with that pitch. And again, objectively, it's it wasn't a strike. So location wise, if you're trying to paint and be you know not leave something over the middle of the plate, then I, he executed it in that way. But you're talking 92 sinker. Again, that sinker is supposed to kind of sink in toward the hands. It just looked like Guriel was ready to turn on a sinker. For whatever reason, he seemed to think that that was coming. Like, that's not what Kyle Gibson said. He said you'd have to ask him what he was looking for. But it's the best explanation is like he might, was he guessing? And is that something that might, you know, irk a pitcher a little bit to say like, guy was guessing and guessed right against me. What, you know, what are the odds of that? But then you can ask, what are the odds of that? There was some little scuttlebutt about maybe Kyle Gibson tipping back on Sunday in that first inning when he gave up a couple of three-run bombs. I I think the Cardinals, if he was tipping, and I mentioned this on, uh, I think this was locked on Cardinals that I did with JD the other day. If he was tipping, the Cardinals addressed it right away, and he ended up you know, finishing out as we gave him credit that six-inning outing on Sunday against Miami and only allowed one run the rest of that game. So if he was tipping in the first inning, it wasn't something that continued. It would be hard to think that he was tipping anything here. It was just a weird moment, especially with the pitch com. It's kind of bizarre to hear a guy saying, oh, I was trying to find the button, and I couldn't find the button. It's like over the course of the history of baseball, how often it would – I mean, what, that would have sounded ridiculous three or four years ago. But that's – everybody uses the pitch com now. It's more common, and that's just sometimes you're dealing with the technology of it. And again, maybe he's just typically used to saying, yeah, whatever Wilson's calling outside of a a couple of pitches here and there throughout a game, I'm going to basically say I'm on the same page. That was a big spot. Gibby thought he knew what he wanted in that spot. And then ultimately he says, I, yeah, I should have probably just gone with what Willie did, which was call for the slider. And it maybe would have been a different result. Um, And I'm thinking if you execute, if Guriel was cheating and looking to, and again, I don't mean cheating, not like Altuve cheating. I mean, if he was was cheating on a on an inside fastball, trying to make sure he could get the hands around on that sinker in on the hands, and that's what he was looking for. Good luck 
on a slider if he if he executes a slider on the dot just lower half low and away that's probably something he swings right through uh or Gibson can maybe put it in the strike zone and if he's looking in that's not a pitch that maybe he which major league hitters like if you're if you're looking for that fastball in you might be able to adjust a little bit to the breaking ball away but I think it would have been a, a pitch that ultimately we didn't know it at the time Gibson didn't know it at the time maybe Contreras you know had that thought process at the time but that slider might have been the pitch in that moment and it didn't end up going through. But it's interesting that Gibson says, you know, how many times I could that have been hit a pitch like that, located like that for extra bases against me in my career. I seem to remember, I think Miles Michaelis threw almost an identical pitch to Mookie Betts. I think it was Miles and it might have been somebody else, but th- there was a pitch that Miles, or, or like I said, there was a pitch that somebody, and, and remind me in the comment section if you recall what I'm talking about from the opening series in LA. One of the home runs that Betts had was just, off the plate, in on the hands, but Betts was hunting and was able to deposit it. And I wish I could remember offhand which pitcher that was, but that's like you got some Cardinal starters that aren't throwing 95, 96. So if you're lo- locating a, a 91, 92 sinker in on the hands, if the if the batter's looking for it, it may not be enough, even if you locate it well, to not occasionally, again, if they're hunting for it, you get punished. And that's just unfortunate that it happened the way that it did today. It's unfortunate too that the, that it cost the Cardinals because they only give up four runs. The bullpen was was solid. We, you saw a good version of Ryan Fernandez tonight in relief. Palante. It was only a couple of innings that they needed because you got your six innings out of Gibson. Once again, I know the ERA. I'm looking at it. Six point one six for Kyle Gibson at this point. Six innings, four runs is what he was brought in to do. Ideally, he doesn't give up that homer to Guriel, and maybe it ends up only being one or two or three runs, and it's a different story for the game. But the Cardinals scored two. We got to continue to harp on it when they don't put the runs up. It's great to score nine. It was great to score nine in game one of this series on Friday. They scored two on Saturday. The inconsistency. They need to have, I don't know what the number is because I I don't have access to the data. I'm sure it's out there of like how many times did the Cardinals score five or more runs last year? How many times did the league average team score five or more runs last year? How many times did the league average team score four or more runs last year? The Cardinals need to be above whatever that pace is. And right now, it certainly feels like they're below it. And you, it's great. You get credit for the nine that you scored on Friday. When you add nine plus the two and you average that out, that's five and a half. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a scoring average that you're talking about. The Cardinals need more of the types of games where they score five and six and then turn those those twos into fours and those threes into fives, then they always necessarily need to score the nine. And I recognize that Friday they very much needed to score the nine because they gave up a, a six-run fifth inning or whatever inning that was. So you had to you had to score again to take the lead, and then the insurance was certainly something that you appreciated. It was a very well-played game offensively by the Cardinals on Friday. But it's back to kind of the old the old tricks where you feel like they've turned a corner, and then it's right back to the same old thing that has been I don't know, a bugaboo for this team offensively for a handful of years at this point. It was what people complained about when Jeff Albert was the hitting coach. People, I think, assign too much blame to a hitting coach because it's the players that are ultimately going to make the determination on how these things play out. Philosophy be damned, when these guys get in the box, they're they're the ones up there, right? And you can you can gently remind as a hitting coach or you can you can preach it in, in the cage work and you can preach it during BP, but when that game's going on, is that approach coming through? The players are the ones that have to make that happen, and the Cardinals have had some moments where it's like they can't miss, and then there's some moments tonight where they set the table really well. They they, they get guys on base throughout the game. Up and down the lineup, you had everybody hitting outside of Vic tonight. Everybody in the starting lineup had at least one base hit. The Cardinals ending the game with 11 hits. Only one walk, so I would say you'd like to work Ryan Nelson a little more. The, the way he was able to get deep into this game, despite allowing seven hits, happened because the Cardinals just didn't really work counts against him, particularly early on. I mean, this guy got through six innings on only 81 pitches. The Cardinals were coming out hacking, and I think they thought the, the game plan certainly seemed to be to you know pound this guy into submission, and he threw a pretty good percentage of strikes. He had 58 strikes, but it's also considered a strike when you swing and put the ball in play for an out. So... I think the Cardinals just, I don't know about that philosophy necessarily tonight. I understand it. Take your shot. And, and I think Ollie Marmel would say the same thing. Look, how can you argue with the philosophy when we had seven hits? We were peppering this guy. The problem was the clutch moments. The Cardinals end up going two for 10 with runners in scoring position tonight. 
One of them scores a run. Jordan Walker gets the triple. Mason Wynn drives him in with the double. But then the other one ends up being a base hit where it's just station-to-station baseball. You you have first and second, and now the bases are loaded, and you're unable to figure out a way to get a run home. So you don't really get credit. It is. It's a hit with runners in scoring position. The batter did his job. But it's a moment where it's like, ah, would you have tried to maybe go from third? Maybe not. Not with the way the base running, perhaps, was going tonight for the Cardinals, which is the next topic that I wanted to get into. And I want to shout out Van Hickelstein at VHS on Twitter. It's not at VHS. It's the, his account name is VHS. I think it is at Van Hickelstein. But nevertheless, he'll tweet some different things from the, the, the road broadcasts oftentimes, and it can in pro- providing some very nice perspective. And the Arizona Diamondbacks television broadcast after the game was really harping on the Cardinals' base running, and I think in some ways that was fair, and in others it just made absolutely no sense. One of them was the base running error purportedly by Paul Goldschmidt where he was on third base and it was infield drawn in. I want to say this was either the fifth or sixth inning, and it's a ball hit to the third baseman, and he's basically going on contact, and so he gets hung up between third and home. And they they pointed this out and said, that was a big moment in the game. It absolutely was not. And I know that this is something that most people listening to this podcast have probably not even seen, but in terms of Goldie in that moment, it was honestly completely neutral in terms of base running. He was able to stay in the rundown long enough that it was still second and third. There was going to be an out on that play regardless. If the third baseman wants to take the chopper and throw to first base to get the batter, he could have easily done so. It ended up still being second and third. The exact identical outcome occurred. It's just there were different guys at second, different guys at third as a result. So that one was just completely irrelevant in terms of being critical. What Goldie did was just fine because he was able to stay in the rundown. I've got no issue with it at all. The next one I do think was a bit of a tough one by Nolan Gorman, and I forget who hit the fly ball, the kind of sinking liner to right field thereafter, but Gorman is at third base in this moment. And again, to be fair, I only saw the replay. I wasn't living these in the moment like y'all, so let me know if I'm I'm off base on this one. I never try to be that guy that like will say something definitively. I'll see that sometimes on Twitter, and I'll say, all right, let's see how this plays out. Like, they're not saying it as a prediction. They're saying it that, like, this is just the way the world is. I'm like, well, you're... You're predicting something. Let's be clear that, like, it's not necessarily going to come true. And then, you know, in certain cases it doesn't, and you look back and go, okay, so that that's why I try. And I'm, I'm not always successful at this, but I try to say, all right, here's kind of how I'm looking at it. Don't, you know, don't take this as, as the law or anything. So if I'm getting this wrong, let me know. My read on the Gorman one where he doesn't tag up from third base on the the fly ball slash sinking liner, uh, sinking liner, excuse me, to right field was that it was a tough read off the bat because it was a little bit of a goofy contact with the way that it was hit, but there's really nowhere else for Gorman to be besides being on the bag, even though the contact was a little bit kind of in between. Being on that bag is really the only spot for him because you've got to figure you have the speed to score regardless if the ball ends up dropping in. If it doesn't, you got to be tagging up to score. So that one, I think, like I said, tough read. But it is one that you really wish you had back. And and just fundamentally, there's really not too much to be gained for for Gorman to be off the bag or, or, you know, taking a secondary lead at that point. It's get back to the bag to where if it does get caught, you can then make a decision from a position of like you're ready to go if you're going to test the right fielder's arm or not. Mason Wynn then had one a little bit later on. That was another tough one. I think he takes, and he was on second base. It was a line drive on the infield to the left side. He takes that one step on contact toward third. I think it ends up being too much because he had a pretty good size lead. But I honestly couldn't tell if it was maybe much more than just a secondary lead that he was taking rather than like he darts toward third on contact. I think it was kind of in between on that. That's certainly a tough one, though, specifically because it happened like one inning after the Gorman won, and it was just, it felt like it was kind of mounting. So there was a little bit of a base runner thing going on for the Cardinals tonight. Nothing like super drastic. I think each of these plays were, again, was it fundamentally the exact right play? Maybe not, but I also could see that the just a little bit difficult on the contact. But if this is something that Cardinals fans were really harping on, let me know in the comments below. And and if you feel that way, certainly let me know. I thought, you know, a little bit, I could certainly see why it was a topic somewhat post-game uh, with, with the reporters talking to Ollie Marmel, but I don't think it was necessarily the full reason they lost the game, but certainly those things do contribute, excuse me, on a night where you go two for 10 with runners in scoring position, you ultimately only score two runs. This kind of game has happened to the Cardinals a lot in recent years, it feels like. You've got a guy on the mound, 
He's got an ADRA. They say, hey, we're going to go aggressive and we're going to we're going to punch this guy out. We're going to knock him out of the game. That certainly seemed to be the game plan. They were getting contact. They were getting hits against him. They were aggressive early in counts, but they weren't able to deliver the knockout blow. And next thing you know, you look up and he's through six innings, allowing one run on 80 pitches. Where you go, man, a pitcher of that caliber, a guy who comes in with an ADRA, you might also decide to be a little more selective against him, make him work a little bit so that you wear him out. And then when the time is right, you strike. So that's like a philosophical thing. Let me know. And again, I don't think there's a perfect answer for this because the way a game unfolds, they play 162 of them. Some of them are a little fluky. Some of them, some things happen that you might have had a plan, but then the game is flowing in a certain way. And so you decide you are going to be a little more aggressive and swing early in counts. So let me know what your thoughts are, Cardinals fans, on the offense on Saturday. It, again, just one of those games might be the answer to it. But it's frustrating when you're ping pong in between 500, now you're game below, and then you have a great game to get back at 500, and then it kind of resets the cycle again with another one of those games where you score fewer than you, you, three or fewer. That's been the, the hallmark to me. If they're scoring four, you at least have a chance to conceivably go to extra innings because this Cardinal team is going to allow four runs in a lot of games this year. They just are. Kyle Gibson's going to go six and four. Lance Lynn's going to go, you know, five and two thirds and one, and then the bullpen's going to give up a couple that day. It's just going to be Miles Michaelis is going to go six and two, and then the bullpen's going to, you know, they're, they're going to have a, a rough moment in time. These things are going to happen. Can the Cardinal offense be the thing that paces the team? I will be beating this horse until it's dead and buried in 2024 because I do think it is the most important part of what this Cardinal team is going to be. Whether they're going to sink or swim will be determined by how consistently they can they can scratch across run number three, four, and five rather than just stop at two or three. It's going to matter in a whole lot of these games because they're getting the kind of pitching that keeps them relevant in these games. They're not getting the clutch hits consistently enough to be, you know, a nine and six ball club right now. They're seven and eight for that exact reason. It's like nothing individually is happening in these losses that is like so damning that it's unfixable. But it's kind of like a gnat in your hair. On the, uh, you're on you're on the beach. You're hanging out by the ocean. Things are supposed to be going well. You know you're bet, you're glad baseball is back. So it's just but that godforsaken gnat. You're just not even sure it's even there. But you can kind of feel it. You're pretty sure you smacked it to the ground at one point. But you still feel like there's a damn gnat or a fly. They're buzzing around you. It, it's kind of like that. It's not the end of the world. But it's kind of like this isn't what it's really supposed to feel like right now. When you're getting this kind of pitching, this is not the way these games are supposed to be playing out. They, but they can't get off this, like, sub-500. Now they're back to 500, but then they, oh, they lose it. It's like a magnet right now. So I think that level of annoyance, that's why I think some of these do feel worse than they probably are, combined with the fact that they were terrible last year. They lost 91 games, and so people are just, like, primed for wondering if if the bottom's going to drop out and they're going to be right back in into that, you know, spooky Mormon hell dream to, uh, to bring it full circle to the the musical I saw tonight. Anyway, if you don't get that reference, just skip it. The one thing I will say, and again, I didn't watch the totality of these at-bats. I found some random dude on YouTube who posted a 14-minute video, and the last three minutes of him are like racing car video game. It's like, I don't even know why he put that in there, but I don't know if it was illegally found the game or what it was, but MLB didn't have the condensed game up yet, so I watched this dude's video, and I saw every single pitch, basically, of this game, but he like once it made contact, he's like, yep, that's where it went. Okay, moving on. So anyway, I watched this, but I didn't watch it like you guys did. So let me know in the comments below what you think, what you thought, what you felt during this Cardinals loss tonight. The one thing I will say offensively, I, I don't want to see too many games where Ivan Herrera is not in the lineup. And I don't have the perfect answer. I'm going to be that guy that everyone hates because I'm going to come up with a problem, but I'm not really going to give you a solution. I think you got to find a way to get Yvonne Herrera into these games more often. I do not care about the notion that you have only two catchers, so you can't play them both because what if there's an injury? Deal with it. You, if there's an injury, and I don't think the Cardinals feel this way either because they figured out ways to get both those guys in uh, before the initial Contreras injury. They were doing it. And then I think if somebody gets injured, you figure it out for that night, and then Pajes is right back here wherever he needs to be the next day. But now with Newbar back, it, there's a little bit more of a squeeze on, well, Donovan was DHing today because you're not taking him out of the lineup. You're not taking Gorman out. You're not. I don't have a great solution, but I do think this is the second game where we haven't seen Herrera in the starting lineup. I think he should be playing at least like half the time, and I don't exactly know how you do that. 
Is it, you know, occasional days off for Walker? I wouldn't really do that right now because he's got a couple games in a row now with, with a nice swing and an extra base hit. I was so impressed by the double that he hit on Friday and then ended up with a triple tonight down the left field line. So I want to see more Jordan Walker to because if they can get him going, that's another, I call it infinity stone. If you can get enough infinity stones in this lineup, like Paul Goldsmith's an infinity stone. You're not going out and going, well, who are we trading for to improve at first base? Arenado, infinity stone. Brandon Donovan, infinity stone. I think Wilson Contreras is in that category as well in terms of what a, what a catcher can do offensively at the plate. Lars Newpar should have that kind of year this year. You're talking about like one through six being pretty locked and loaded. Jordan Walker can uh, uh, ascend to that status, I think. He's just not done it yet. But if you're starting to see him swing the ball well, swing the bat well, don't swing the ball. That'd be weird. You're seeing him swing the bat better and making some extra base type of contact. I want to keep him in the, in the lineup as much as possible. So like I said, I don't have a perfect solution to it, but I do think Ivan Herrera was swinging it real well, and I don't think that's something that was fluky. You want to continue to, to give that guy opportunities if you can. Maybe there's a moment here, Victor Scott, maybe off day Sunday. Uh, the 0 for 4, he was, he was you know, kind of back to having – he's not even struggling. I get it, he's hitting 098. Look at the contact. He's he's in the air more than he should be. It's the opposite of, of what they want from Jordan Walker. They want Walker in the air because he can hit the ball hard. Scott is hitting the, having a nice – he's got a nice swing, but he doesn't have home run power, and it's just all these fly balls are being caught. I'll take my chances on the ground with Victor Scott because he's going to beat out a lot of those – not a lot of them, but a good number of those ground balls that other people would have no business even, you know, being a step or two away from the bag. He's going to get some hits on those at some point. It may require the occasional Newt Bar and center to get Herrera in there more often. I don't know what the right answer is, though. But I think that's one where it's like, okay, Victor's the lefty bat. If you're going to, you know, Herrera against a left-handed pitcher, if there's an opportunity to do that, maybe that's when you do it. But you don't see all too many lefties throughout the season either. You're, you're always going to see more right-handed starting pitchers than you are lefties. And I think it's Zach Gallon on the Hill Sunday for Arizona. So it's not applicable there. That was just my one comment though. I, 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 like I said, I'm that guy. Everybody hates that guy. I'm, I'm telling you, you've got an issue, but I'm not telling you that there's an obvious way to fix it. I'm just going to kind of like drop the bomb and walk away, which nobody likes, but it is something I go, man, Herrera was swinging it well. So maybe Ollie can find a way to get him back in there. But I'm saying this with the full acknowledgement that it's not like a very easy solution because you do have a lot of guys that you'd like to get in there day to day. And it, it's just not always going to be super easy to figure out, but those are really all my thoughts. I don't tend to have as many thoughts when I don't watch a single moment of the game and they make you turn your phones off when you're there at the Fox theater. So i complied. I did. And I didn't check. I didn't know a damn thing until I got out of there and was able to kind of take a look at what was going on and catch myself up. So a little bit of a truncated edition today, but guess what? It's another be safe daily. I don't want to leave you guys in the lurch. Um, I wanted to make sure to still put something out. So let me know your thoughts. Let me know. You guys fill in the gaps for me. What did I miss? What do I need to know? You'd be my resource this time. What do I need to know about this game that maybe goes overlooked if you didn't watch and lock into the whole thing the way a lot of Cardinals fans do each and every night because that's how passionate you guys are. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for listening. Thank you guys for subscribing. Again, I want to see those percentages where YouTube tells me 55% of my of my watch time on the on the channel comes from people who subscribe to the channel. Well, these other 45, you guys are coming back. You guys are return viewers. I know you are. Hit that subscribe button on the way out. Throw a like on this video. Drop your comment below that says, hey, Brendan kept whining about subscribers, and I realized I've seen this guy a few times. I'm going to give him a shot. I'm going to subscribe. Throw that in the comment if that's you tonight, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Uh, this has been B-Shape Daily. We'll talk to you next time on the show. Peace.